Art is Hard. My name is Alicia DeSantis, founder of 38th and Kip Studio, a branding, graphic design, and illustration studio. Today, we have an incredible artist whose methodology rests entirely in the cyanotype process. Marita Wei is a self-taught cyanotype artist born on a remote island on the west coast of Canada, surrounded by nature. She uses the historical, cameraless photographic process of cyanotype to share her lifelong love of flowers. Most of her subjects are grown from seed in her small London garden. So this means from start to finish, her work can take many months to complete. She's inspired by the history and folklore of plants. She now lives and works in London, England. It's truly in a world of AI and computer generated content, truly an analog methodology that she works in. And it's very beautiful and it's very haunting to see these leaves and these flowers developed in a way that I, for one, have never seen before. It's a, certainly a fascinating. Uh, profession and it's one that takes great patience and I commend her for that and I applaud her unique creative methodology and something that has such strong roots in history. Her work fascinates me and I'm so excited to have her on the show today to talk about her methodology, her inspirations, and her challenges behind creating these beautiful and ethereal pieces of art. Welcome back, everyone. I have Marita Way here to talk with us about her gorgeous cyanotype botanical prints. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for asking me. I really feel privileged. <laughs> I when we were offline just a few moments ago, I was telling Marita about um, how her piece was suggested to me on Instagram, and I was blown away by how unique they looked in a space of thousands of other pieces of art I see on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, thank you. That's really kind. It's a huge compliment. It's sort of hard when you're in that space all the time. To, to see what maybe someone else coming in doesn't see or sees in your work. So oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about, and, and I myself, I, I come from a printmaking background and I've done a little bit of um, traditional photography with darkroom and things like that. But I'm, I'm, to be honest, I don't know much about cyanotype at all. Can you tell me a little bit about um, your piece here that I have? Uh, and it's called Lily, correct? It's a fawn lily. Fawn lily. It's a urethroneum, eurith which is the Latin name for the fawn lily, which is a wildflower from the Pacific West Coast of North America. But there's also lots of flowers in that species throughout Europe. Um, but going back to the cyanotype, is one of the first photographic processes. So it was being developed... Actually, it was created before photography, but sort of alongside it, the um, man, John Herschel, uh, developed it to as an easy way to copy all his scientific notes. And he was actually friends with Henry Fox Talbot, who developed photography. So they, no they were sort of in, in the circle, you know, in that time in England, in the sort of Royal Society, or, you know, they were scientists working at the same time. And he, um, John Herschel was also friends with a woman called Anna Aikens, who is like the original cyanotype artist from 1843. She was his neighbor and learned the process from him and then went on to create basically the first book published with photography and certainly the first female photographer. Um, it was a folio of 
algaes, British algaes. So it's all seaweeds. And then she did folios on ferns. So she's got hundreds of cyanotypes sort of as scientific illustrations for these books on the plants and seaweeds from the UK. Wow. Wow. So how, so how do you actually, that, that's a very niche, it's a very yes. niche. <laughs> how exactly do you go about doing this? Uh, I'm guessing it, it's, it's ink? So it's actually two chemicals, uh, potassium ferrocyanide and um, ferric ammonium citrate. And they're sort of iron salts. So when they're mixed together um, with water in a solution, they become light sensitive and then you coat your surface. I mean, you do, can do paper or anything sort of porous. And then that is becomes light sensitive. So you, then you put something on top of it. And if you use a negative, then that's a photograph. And if you use an object, it's called a photogram. So I generally use um, plants and flowers. And then you expose it to UV light, which I like to use the sun, but you can use lamps and things. And then that you develop it just by washing it in water. So it's actually quite a um, sustainable photography process. One of the least chemical, the chemicals actually in cyanotype are not harsh chemicals. They can, one of them's in food and things that you eat. So it's not mm-hmm. a, a sort of a better for the environment type of photography. <laughs> Yeah, and then yeah. you wash it in water, and within twenty four hours, the full range of the deep blue will develop, which is the Prussian blue, which comes from the iron salts. Wow, and that, that's interesting. You bring that up about the the eco friendly components of it, because I I'm remiss to say that I was just made aware that after all this time, that um, film photography is not vegetarian; it's made from gelatin. Yes. And, I, so, and I, as a vegetarian, I was shocked by that. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, now you can buy, I mean, for me, I can buy paper that is, it says vegan friendly. So it's sized with something, lots of paper is sized with gelatin. And this is sized with something, obviously, that's made from plants. So it's once you start going down, it's like a total rabbit hole of how to do the best for everybody. Yeah. I love it. And I'm curious to know, you have so many great pieces, why you chose this piece to share with me today amongst all the others. So uh, this piece I just recently made and I felt it was the first good thing I've made this year. (laughs) You know, when sort of my cyanotype is very seasonal. I mean, I use the sun to expose everything. And I have sort of a limited window. The best sun for cyanotype is between 11 and 2 p.m. And I live in London where it's often not sunny. Yeah. (laughs) And so actually getting out to have a chance to do that is sort of happens much less often than I would like. So this one was like the first really good sunny day and it came out really clear and it's sort of slightly... It's got this watercolor effect, which I've been playing mm-hmm. around with recently, which I just, I don't know, sometimes something happens and you think, oh, that's it. That's the one. And I probably made 10 other pieces that day and they're all in a big stack and we'll never see the light of day. It's so haunting. And that's what I love about it. It has such a, um, well, for, well, I, I saw in your bio that you are intrigued by historical um, folklore, things like that. And I myself am the same way, the probably butchering it, the Miller Fleuris and the medieval um, tapestries oh, yeah. yes. with like the, the unicorn tapestries that I was so blessed to see in Paris oh. and just the, the uh, wallpaper of flowers in botany that they wove into those pieces. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. And what you've done is you've taken that and you've taken one, like one piece from the Miller Flores and you've really focused on it. And it still has that historic, um, it feels very ancient and very precious. And I love that about it. Oh, I'm glad because that is, I really, 
I love sort of the stories behind the flowers. I mean, it's not just, I mean, obviously they're beautiful and, but it's like they have such a history and they have so, there's so much information about them that you don't know, you know, you just see, oh, that's a pretty bouquet or whatever. And then you, if you go a bit deeper into it, there's all these stories, all the folklore, the history of how, you know, it really shaped the world. Plant hunters, I find really fascinating um, and how their sort of searches for new things changed the world you know, in like the, um, when they went to Botany Bay on that voyage, it's named Botany Bay because they collected something like a thousand new specimens of plants and brought them back to the British Museum and uh, the Natural History Museum. And you can still, you can see in the Natural History Museum now the specimens from that voyage. And then, you know, it's just amazing. And then it developed a relationship with those areas. I mean, obviously, there were also people there already and the sort of the indigenous stories I got quite interested in when I was in Canada last year because that's a whole different way of looking at plants and they the um Comox people which is the um indigenous people where I grew up apparently the bulb of the fawn lily you could use as a food stuff like it was edible and also it grows next to this type of fritillaria and the and then a camas bulb and they would cultivate these fields and they're there today this beautiful blue field of camas right by the beach you know it looks like bluebells but it but actually it's been cultivated by the indigenous people because they would come over and replant the bulbs every year and harvest it and it's just you know it there's so much more information mm-hmm. there. Yeah, exactly. And on that note, we've talked a little bit about a different cyanotype um, history and uh, florists and things like that. Um, do you have any artists that inspire you outside of uh, the niche of cyanotype? I think probably my first favorite artist is Degas. And going and seeing his ballerinas at the Musée d'Orsay, that is like, they just, it's like there's a light coming from within them. And the light is also obviously another really important thing in cyanotype, but they just look like they're glowing and there's something so sort of magical about them. So that he's, he's sort of my number one, if you ask me, oh, who's your favourite artist? But there's so many, I mean, and then right now I'm, very into tulips and then my daughter got a, ch- a children's book of George O'Keefe for her birthday and so mm-hmm. I'm reading that and I was like wow and you know her the way she magnified things so you just get this totally different view I, f- I think that's really interesting her um, work is unbelievable it's yeah. someone who lives in the American Southwest I yeah. frequent Santa Fe I go to Santa Fe every year and mm. just to be in that environment where she resided you you know so much of her life have you been to the santa fe or new mexico no no i'd love to go it's i mean it it sounds so cliche but people photographers go there and artists for the light there's something about the wherever it sits on the planet that it gets this really incredible light that that it doesn't get anywhere else and it's just stunning i think you'd really love it i put it on the list um, and then another female artist now is Ronnie Nicole. And I'm she, not familiar with her. Oh, her work is just, it's really beautiful. She does these quite sort of simple looking, um, she calls them floral fossils. So they're basically flowers in plaster. Um, but they have a look at her work. They're just it's the way she talks about the flowers, the way she thinks about them. Her compositions are sort of just really elegant. And yeah, I, I am a big fan of her work right now. Beautiful sort of, and she has a really nice way of talking about creating art and who to create art for. And it's, yeah, she's, I, I admire her a lot. Who to create art for. That's an interesting question. Like, as in, like <laughs> trying not to please sort of everyone who maybe wants 
something from you, wants you to create something for them and staying sort of, you know, true to your ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what, you know, is, is someone who does this for a living and in, what would you say to people who, you know, our viewers who are watching, who aren't professional artists and don't know about the craft. What would I say? Just start. Because I wasn't a professional artist and you have to just start and learn as you go. And I think so many things hold you back and always, for me, definitely waiting, wanting to wait till everything's perfect and you think you know everything and then you can put this out there. And if you just start small by putting one thing out, then you'll, it, it sort of snowballs from there. And to not get overwhelmed by thinking, oh, I'm here, I'd like to be this professional artist who's really successful and has done all this stuff, but actually maybe on the way there, it's easier to think in like small steps. To get there, I'm going to start by making this today and then doing something else tomorrow and just little by little. And then all of a sudden you look and you're like, oh, look what, look what I did now. Look what I was doing last year. And you can't help but sort of to progress. And I, I think as an artist, you can never, I mean, your artists are always trying something new, doing something, even, you know, just tweaking things a little bit. And it may not seem like progress. And sometimes progress is going back <laughs> and then going forward again. But you, you'll, over the long term, when you look back, you can actually see sort of how you've got to where you are. Absolutely. I still you're feel like I'm, I'm down here. <laughs> exactly. You're not going to get worse. You're not going to get the, worse. It's impossible. And, I, and also, I think you're never, you're never, here, you're never at the top. You know, you, even when you think you've got there, then you can see so much further and you're always going to want to be learning something new and creating new things. Like, I don't think any artist has ever said, well, I've done my best. I'm finished now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> There's one of, my, one of my previous um, uh, guests is so funny as photographer. And he says he has that fear that he's it's a it's a constant fear that this is the best photograph I'm ever going to take. And it's all downhill from here. Oh. <laughs> and so it just it just shows you that as artists and as creatives working in an environment where there really are no strict numbers, there's really no formula to success. You're knowing how yeah. good you are. We have challenges that other people don't have. You just, it's hard to know. There's a lot of psychology behind being an artist. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's sometimes, you know, you can see with Instagram and stuff, so many influences, and then you just can't compare yourself to anyone else. No one's in your situation. No one's making exactly what you're making with your ideas and everything. And if you, start to look around in a comparison with a comparison view then I think you would be paralyzed and just think why am I doing you know I don't know I understand I understand completely that that it's a blessing and a curse the world we live in right now that you have so much inspiration and so much more ability to learn about new artists and and just new things around the world but then on the flip side of that it can be too much it can be damaging absolutely I mean it's it is it does seem to be a very fine line but also I think the the plus side of that it uh, is that you can meet sort of like-minded people I mean I've met so many wonderful people who you know I end up corresponding daily with or you share ideas and then all these other sort of wonderful things come from that so it's it's sort of navigating that too much too little where do you want to walk I couldn't agree more and on that note you can find Marita all over the internet she has a great instagram account uh she has a website it's on the screen right here and feel free to 
reach out, connect, um, like her work. It's in a world of AI, it's refreshing to see something that's completely done by hand. And uh, it, it restores, you know, hope in humanity that the matrix isn't taking us over anytime soon. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, really appreciate it. It's an honor. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. Have a good one.